Maranatha, my loved ones, and welcome again to our prophecy seminar, Unveiling Revelation, Your Life is About to Change Forever. Today we're going to talk, uh, hit on topic number three, the dragon and the beast in Revelation, part number two. But before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for just giving us a chance to come together, continue to study your word. We thank you for, for your patience, for your love, for your mercy towards us. And we thank you for all these things. And we know that none of these things are based on, on anything that we've done, but it's based on the merits of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we just ask, Father, that you continue to guide us and strengthen us as we continue to study your word and that we can come away with a great blessing as you always desire for us. We thank you for this and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the last presentation we were talking, we were initiating this topic about uh, evil, right? And with the question that we had was, how, does, how can you explain evil if God is loving, if God is all powerful? How can evil be explained? And so we're following up on that topic because remember, there were two questions. The first one is, how is it that how can you explain evil if God is love and all powerful? And the second question is, how is God going to solve the problem of sin and, and, and evil without destroying us? We talked about that it's interesting that in humanity, right? It's sad in humanity. We have both the love of God because we are, we are created from God. But at the same time, we have evil in us, right? And, and those two things joined together. The one thing that God loves, is, which is our us, is us, his created beings. And the thing that God hates is sin. And yet in us, we find these two things are combined. They're joined. And so God promises in his word that he's going to put an end to sin and suffering and pain. He's going to, but to do that, he has to separate us from sin, right? Our next presentation, we're going to go breaking down as we go into the sanctuary. Because if you remember, I mentioned... We're going to see that the sanctuary is the plan of salvation where God separates. He separates us from sin so that we can dwell in his presence again. So last time we talked about the evil and how did evil start, right? Did God create evil? Did God create uh, this world that we see? And we saw and we studied in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that everything was perfect. God created everything perfect, right? But we noticed then, my loved ones, that that perfection has not lasted. We, don't, we see the world how it is, the atrocities, the murders, the pain, the suffering. And when we had to study and we had to go back a little bit farther, and we studied about this being called Lucifer, right? This covering cherub who God created perfect, amazing. The Bible infers that he is the most intelligent, most beautiful, most str the strongest of all of God's creation. And he was the highest placed of them all. But sadly, we see that he was not content with being right there in the very presence of God. He was not content with that high honor, the highest honor given to any created being. But he wanted more. He wanted the throne of God. He wanted the worship that belonged to God. He desired that those things that were God proper to God. And we saw that it said that he wanted to be God, right? And he carried out his rebellion and he was able to take with him, as we saw, one third of the angels of heaven. And that rebellion then continued and growed. Now the question we're going to ask, answer today is, how did that rebellion get here? How is it possible that we are caught up in the middle of this cosmic conflict when we have nothing to do? We were in a round when this rebellion, when this battle started in heaven. How is it that it got here to earth? How is it that it came here? And the answer to that question is of how did we get caught up in this battle is found in what I consider the most important chapter in the Bible. My opinion, don't, 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 you know, if you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine. But I think that the most important chapter in the Bible is Genesis chapter 3. So I want you to go with me, please, to Genesis chapter 3. I think that Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to show you why, is has everything explained. All of the situations that we see, everything is broken down and the solution is in Genesis chapter 3. And if you understand, my loved ones, these first three chapters in Genesis, especially if you go a little bit further into the book of Genesis, Genesis explains it all. Now you're probably sitting there and saying, wait a minute, I was told that this is going to be a prophecy on Revelation. And why are you starting in the book of Genesis? Well, my loved ones, is because Revelation talks about the end, right? Revelation is the culmination of everything that is happening in the Bible. But to understand the end, we have to go back to the 
beginning. It's by understanding how things started, how it all became, is that we're able to understand the end. And so this is why the book of Genesis, which is the book of origins, is so important to understanding the things that are happening in the book of Revelation as we're going to share today. So go with me, please, to Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to start on verse number 1. Remember, before we start, Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, everything is perfect, everything is great. There's no pain, no suffering, no, no murder, no suicide, nothing. So what happened? Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was, cun was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. Now, if you remember, we talked about the serpent last time and in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7, it talks about what? It says that the serpent of old, right? Who is the serpent of old? That dragon who is the devil. So here we see the devil masquerading or hiding behind a serpent. Continues to say, he was more cunning than any beast of the, world, of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, we have an issue here, my loved ones, and is that the devil is trying to communicate. He's trying to interact with, this, with Eve. He's trying to interact with humanity. And so here's the first problem. Here's the first thing is that we need to be careful that we do not enter into an open discussion with him because as the Bible says, he is the most cunning of all created beings. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the tree, the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. So she, she comes into this dialogue with the devil, and she tells him, well, you know what? We have permission to eat all the trees, right? But we cannot eat from where? From the tree of good and evil. So we see, my loved ones, that in the midst God, in the midst of perfection, God puts this tree, this very interesting and specific tree that God placed in the Garden of Eden, a simple test of loyalty. This tree, which we're talking about, is interesting. It's what actually caused and initiated all of this situation. This tree that is in the midst, my loved one, if we're going to break it down, I like to talk about or look at this tree in the context of a voting booth. Remember that the, the great controversy, that great battle in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, said that there was a battle, and that word was, there was a debate, there was a political debate, a battle of ideas. And so what you see is that God in all the perfection, everything that he created for Adam and Eve here on earth, he put this one simple tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Go with me, please, to Genesis chapter 2. And let's read here where God says and shows them about the tree. It says in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the earth. And the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed, and of the ground of the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And look at what it says in verse number 15. Then God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So here is there, there are two very interesting trees in the garden of Eden. It's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we're going to talk about the tree of life later on down in this seminar. We're going to focus today on this tree of good knowledge of good and evil. Notice that God created perfection. God created everything, and there were probably millions and millions and billions of trees, and they were there for what? For the pleasurement of Adam and Eve. And God said what? God put a very simple test to Adam and Eve, a very simple test. He said, do not eat of this tree because if you do, you shall surely, certainly die. Now I have a question. Is this a difficult test, right? Most, sometimes people say, yes, it is. But actually, it's not a difficult test. Why? 
because there is abundance of trees, right? There is abundance of trees. God said, all of the trees you can eat, they all belong to you, but there is one tree that I do not want you to touch, and it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This tree, my loved ones, represents a voting, a voting booth. And what, what, am I, what am I making reference to? If Adam and Eve chose not to eat from the tree, then what happens? Then they are voting. They are taking a stand in favor of God's government. God, when God created the earth, he gave it as a gift to Adam and Eve. It was their wedding gift, actually. And Adam and Eve were the king and queen of this earth. And God said, listen, if you want the earth to remain under my jurisdiction, if you want the earth to remain under the kingdom of God, then here is this test. Just stay loyal to me, right? Here again, we're seeing free will. Here we're seeing God how he doesn't force anybody to follow him. He doesn't force anybody to do his will. God is out of love. He shows us and he gives us this opportunity because we are not some type of computer. That is the essence of love. It's freedom. And we're going to be seeing that again as we continue to go on. So here is this tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It's like a voting booth, right? And so if Adam and Eve choose to not eat from it, they're voting in favor of God's kingdom. But if they choose to eat of this tree of knowledge and good and evil, what are they doing? They're making a vote. They're voting in favor of who? They're voting in favor of the kingdom of the enemy, right? They're putting their hands in his, in, in his they're putting their lives in his hands, my loved ones. Let's continue in Genesis chapter 3. So we notice that Eve is interacting with the devil, and that's, of course, the first issue and the first problem. And it says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Let's, here is the accusation, my loved ones. What did God tell Adam and Eve? He said, The day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And what is the devil saying here? The devil said to the woman, You will not surely die. Or in other words, God lied to you. That's what the devil is saying. Did God tell you that you were not going to die? Understand that God has lied to you. God is a liar. Here again is the accusation, remember. The enemy had raised up. He was slandering. He was accusing. He was attacking God's character by saying that he should be the one in charge, that God he should not be in charge of the universe. And here we're seeing another accusation. He's basically saying God is a liar. God lied to you. He doesn't want you to eat from the tree, so he died, lied to you. Now the question is, what? why does the devil say this? Watch what he says. For God knows that in the day, we're in verse number five, the day you eat of it, of the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So, his, look at how it goes deeper. It's telling us again then that what is the devil saying? The, is, the devil is saying, you know, God lied to you. God lied to you. He does not want you to eat of the tree of life. And the reason God has lied to you is why? Is because God does not want you to eat of it, for he knows that the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. In other words, God is selfish. God lied to you because he knows that if you eat of it, you will be like him and God does not want competition. Right? That's the accusation. God is being selfish. He doesn't want you to partake of the things that he knows and what he has. He wants to do, he wants to rule all by himself. He's just a selfish being. And that's the accusation that the devil is pointing to. Now the question is, what does it mean to be like God? Right? That's a very important question. Let's continue to read verse number five. For in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. And here's the answer to what it does mean to be like God. Knowing Good and evil. Now, this phrase, knowing good and evil, is a very interesting phrase, and it, give, it gave me some battle for a while. For a time, I was struggled with this phrase, knowing good and evil. And my question was, what does it mean to know good and evil, right? What does it mean that to be like God is to know good and evil? And I struggled and I battled with this, and I started to investigate and, and looked at different Bible commentaries and tried to find out what does it mean to be to be like God, to know good and evil. But I couldn't find an answer that gave me, the, you know, that just satisfied my soul. And so what I did was, what I should have done from the, from the beginning is that I used the Bible's best friend. If you remember, I told you, who is the Bible's best friend? It's a concordance, right? Of course, an open heart, the Holy Spirit we need. But along with that, we also can use a concordance and the Holy Spirit using our open heart, will guide us to truth. And so I went to the concordance, and I looked for the word for knowing. And guess what word I found? 
I found the word called known as Jada, the Hebrew word Jada. And so when I looked at the word Jada, what does Jada mean and how is it used in the rest of the Bible? I noticed that the word Jada does mean to know and it definitely falls in context. But it had a deeper meaning. The word Jada also means to declare or to determine. In other words, when, when the devil told them, listen, God lied to you. God does not want you to eat of the tree because you know the day that you do of it. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. What he's telling Eve is, you will be like God, declaring good from evil. Are you following me? Here's the, the dilemma. What is he saying? You don't need God to tell you what's right or wrong. You can do it on your own. You can determine or declare what's right and wrong. You don't need God to tell you what's right and wrong. Now, we know this concept to be the concept of relativity, right? Relativism, it's the postmodern mindset where we don't need God to tell us. And so this postmodern mindset that we're talking about is nothing new. We just found it in the Garden of Eve. In the very beginning, my loved ones, that, was, the, that was, was planted in the minds of Adam and Eve. It was saying what? You don't need God to tell you what's right or wrong. You can determine and declare it on your own. Now, has anything changed? Of course not. Everything is still the same. Do we still have people today that say, I don't need God. I don't need his word to tell me what's right or wrong. I can declare and determine what's right or wrong on my own being. I don't need him for that. My loved ones, nothing has changed from the Garden of Eden. Why? Because still today, humans, the devil has convinced humanity that we don't need God to tell us what's right or wrong. We can do it on our own. So by implying, by humanity saying, thank you, God, right, for doing these. Basically, what was happening is in this voting booth, I'll put it to you this way. Adam and Eve, by eating of the tree of life, what they were saying is, God, they were listening to the devil and saying, we don't need you anymore. We don't need you to tell us what's right or wrong. We can determine and declare what is right or wrong on our, on our own. We can be God. Now, before we get deeper into that, who is the one that wanted to be like God? We read in the previous presentation in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, that the devil wanted to be like the Most High. Was he able to obtain it? No, he was not. So what does he do? He now tricks humanity into thinking what? Into thinking that we also can be God. And I'm sure that this was also part of this argument of his, of, of his slandering in heaven. He's telling humanity and he's saying, you don't need God, right? You can be like him. So since he couldn't do it, he tries to trick us into trying to be like God, being that he was the one that wanted to be like God. Are you following me, my loved ones? Let's continue to read. And it says in verse number six, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So notice, my loved ones, here's the problem. We open the door to the enemy. We open the door to listening to him, to his lies. And what happens? He starts tricking us and he starts playing with words, right? He uses and he takes God's words and he distorts it and he tricks it. And he lures us in because he is the most cunning and most intelligent being ever created. And what happened? Adam and Eve ate from the tree. Now, again, what does that imply? Adam is basically saying, and Eve Sue, thank you, Lord, for have created me. Thank you for giving me this, this handsome husband. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this beautiful wife. But from this moment on, we don't need you to tell us what's right or wrong. We can declare and determine what's right or wrong on our own. Now, what does God do? Does God squash them like a cockroach, right, and destroy them based on this? No, my loved ones, of course not. You know what God does? God steps aside. What? Yes, we talked about love, right? And we see that love, the essence of love is freedom. God gives us freedom that as, as that foundation of love is freedom. God gives us the opportunity to choose. He does not force himself on us. He has given us free will. And this is an evidence of this, in this rebellion of him giving us this opportunity and this options. And God, listen to this. 
when you choose, and I think this is probably one of the most important uh, principles that we will learn during this prophecy seminar, is that when you choose to do, to not follow God's will, when you know what the Word of God says, when you study the Word of God, when you look at it and you know what it says and you say, Lord, I do not want to follow what it says here. I want to do my own thing. You're following in the ways of Adam and Eve and in the ways of the devil. You're basically saying, thank you, Lord, but I don't need you to tell me what's right or wrong. I can determine or declare on my own who, what, is, what is right or wrong. I don't need you. And basically what we're doing is, again, we're placing ourselves in, on, the, on the throne of God. We're saying that we can do those things. And what does God do, my loved ones? Out of respect and love, God steps aside. Understand this. God steps aside. Why? First of all, because if God were to remain in the presence of sin, God, Adam and Eve, would have been destroyed immediately. We're going to see that also. But God steps aside. And when God steps aside, my loved ones, there are three things that step aside with Him. His protection, His blessings, and life itself. So when a human being chooses to disobey God, God steps aside out of, of love, out of respect for their decision, and but with God goes protection, his blessings, and life itself. Now I have a question. If you are not under God's protection, if you're not being guided by God, if he is not watching over you and your family and your home and your business and whatever things that you possess and people that you love, if you don't have God watching over you, then who's in control? It's the enemy. And we saw that in Job, right? Where Job, where the devil said, you protect Job. I have a question. If God were to take away his protection from you and me, do you think we would still be following him? Hmm. Right? Food for thought. But what I'm trying to get to the point of is that God respects it and God steps aside. But understand there are consequences. If there's anything I want you to remember today is that when you choose to disobey God, Understand that God is going to step aside, and when that happens, you are not in his hands. You are in the enemy hands. And that's what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30. The Lord declares, those who, who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly regarded. Here's what we're talking about, the same principle. If you choose and you want God, you want him in your life, and you choose to honor him and follow him and obey him, he is going to do the same. He is going to honor you and watch over you and guide you. But when you choose not to, you are lightly regarded. Those that despise me, those that disobey me, those that choose to walk away from me, God says, then you're not in my hands anymore. You're in the, in the enemy's hands. Now, what was the result we see here of, the, of Adam and Eve's disobedience what what was the what was the result what was the end game of this disobeying God well we see very clearly in Romans chapter 6 verse 16 do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey you are that one slaves whom you obey so the first thing that happened when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God my loved ones is that what is that they became slaves of the enemy because it says that to whom you obey that is your master so by them obeying the enemy by them listening and obeying the enemy that means that they were placing themselves under his dominion are you following me and by putting themselves under his dominion what is the issue that if Adam was the king and Eve was the queen and God had given Adam and Eve uh, to be the governor of, of this kingdom right Adam was the governor Eve was uh, his queen in this context. That means that if Adam was the king of this, of this earth, then that means that the enemy took his place. The enemy then became the ruler of this earth. And a lot of people say, oh, that doesn't sound right. That sounds like you're, you're just talking uh, weird theories. Well, I'll look at, look at, let's look at what it says in John chapter 14, verse 30. I will no longer talk with you, Jesus said, for the ruler of this world is coming. What does Jesus say? He says that the ruler of this world is coming. Who is he making reference to? He's making reference to the enemy. And if you look in Luke chapter 4, some people, just in case, I like to show a number of verses to prove the points that we're trying to make. If you look in Luke chapter 4, it talks about the temptations. And if you look in verse number 5, Luke chapter 4 verse 5, it says, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to Jesus, all this authority I will give you and their glory for thus has been delivered to me and I give it to whoever I 
wish. Therefore, if you will worship, be, worship before me, all, your, all will be yours. Again, the devil trying to trick Jesus, right? Trying to deceive Jesus into worshiping him because he knows that if he's able to do that, then he will have control. Praise the Lord. We'll be talking about that, this conflict that continued to develop. But I want you to understand what the devil told Jesus. He says, all authority I will give to you. In other words, he showed him the kingdom of the world. He said, you see all of this? You see this world, this, this, this planet? I'll give you the power and authority over it. Why? Because it was given to me. He says, all their glory for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whoever I wish. I have a question. Who gave the devil power and authority on this earth as a ruler, my loved ones? What? Adam. Adam is the one that by obeying him, he handed over basically the keys to this kingdom. Now look at what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Not only did the devil become the ruler of this earth, but it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore... Just through the one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men. Notice that another result of the disobedience of Adam and Eve is that what happened? That sin entered the world, and death through sin. So that one man, Adam, what happened? He opened the door to the enemy, and Adam and Eve, we'll put it this way, were infected with the virus of sin. And we talked about sin previously, and we saw that sin, if you want to give it uh, uh, another way of saying sin, I would say it's selfishness, right? That's just a very excellent point of looking at what sin is. It's selfishness. And what is selfishness? Selfishness is thinking about me. Who was the one that thought about himself? We saw in Isaiah chapter 14, the devil says, I will ascend. I will be the most high. I, 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 I. So it's when you're self-centered, when you only think about yourself, you're being selfish, and that is the root of sin. Is everybody following me here? And my loved ones, that's why the world is why it is. Why? Because we make decisions of what's convenient for me, what I like, what I want, and we don't think about other people. When we don't take other people into consideration on our decisions, my loved ones, that is sin. So Adam and Eve were infected with the virus of sin. They were infected with the cancer of selfishness. And that is the reason why you and I and all humanity since has lived and followed in the same footsteps as our first parents. We all have what? We are all selfish. We have that selfish nature that we live and follow by, my loved ones. And this is the other result of rebellion. Understand this. If you disobey God, be it uh, knowingly and willingly or through deceit, it's the same thing. Because Adam, even though the Bible says that Eve was deceived, Adam wasn't deceived. Adam knew what he was doing, and Adam actually made a God out of Eve. He chose to follow his wife, right, over God. He chose to obey his wife. He made an idol of her. And despite that, being willfully or unwillfully, as Eve was deceived, the result, my loved ones, is the same. It's, uh, it's pain, suffering, and eventually it will be death. Is everybody following me? So the dilemma that we find here is now the devil thinks, oh, I've got God where I want him, right? What? I've got God where I want him. Here his two human children have just disobeyed me, have just disobeyed him, I'm sorry. And so the dilemma that is presented to God is what? The devil says, listen, if you destroy me, you have to destroy them because they're sinners, yeah, there's you, you accuse me of sin? Well, so are they. And the same verse, he says, but if you forgive them, if you forgive Adam and Eve, if you forgive them, then you have to forgive me. And so this is the, 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 the devil thinks he's put God against the wall. He thinks he has created this uncomfortable situation, but we are going to see how God solved this, this, this situation. Now, sometimes people ask, why didn't God... Just take the earth away from Adam and Eve. Why didn't he just take it away from, I'm sorry, from, from the devil? Why didn't he take it away if he had obtained it through deception? And the reason is very simple. First of all, we talked about love, right? Freedom. And second of all, it's also because of God's justice. What do I mean by that? God is a just God and the devil knows that God is a just God. So as God gave this earth as a gift... For example, if I give you a, the, the title and the keys to a car and I give it to you and I say, listen, here is a gift. This is for you. 
I have a question. Can you do anything you want with that car? Yes, you're free to do whatever you want with it, right? Because it is a gift. I can't tell you. But if I lend you my keys to my car, and can you do anything you want to that car? No, you cannot. Why? Because that car does not belong to you. So God gave Adam and Eve the kingship of this earth. God became Adam the governor of this earth. It was handed over. And so when the devil, when, when Adam obeys the devil, he hands the keys over to the devil. So the, the devil, knowing that God is just, what is, he, what, is, what is he saying? He says, God is a just God. He's not going to take it away from me. Why? Because I took it away from humans. I took it away from humans. And so the only way that God can take away the kingship of this earth is that it has to be through another human being. Amen? I'm trying to, to lay the groundwork for the things that we're going to be studying in the following presentation. Again, let me put it to you this way. If God would have told the devil, give me back the earth because it doesn't belong to you. You, were, you obtained it through the seat. The devil would have said, wait a minute. You're a just God. And since I took this earth away from Adam, and from Adam, from humanity, it has to be a human that takes it away from me, that recuperates the kingship of this earth. Amen? I'm just, I'm just setting the groundwork for the things that we're going to be studying in the future. And so as we see this earth, my loved one, passed from Adam's hands, from his kingship, and Eve as the queen, it passed over to the devil, my loved ones, and this is exactly what we're seeing. This selfishness, we have been infected with it, but that's not the end of the story. Go with me back to Genesis chapter 3. Go to me to verse number 7, and look what it says here. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Notice something very interesting, my loved ones. It says here that after they disobeyed God in verse number 6, verse number 7 says that they realized that they were naked. Now, what is happening here? Because if you read in Genesis chapter 2, at the end of Genesis chapter 2, it says very clearly that Adam and Eve were naked in verse number 25. They were both naked, the man and the wife, but they were not ashamed. What does it mean that they were naked in Genesis chapter 2? And then in Genesis chapter 3, after they disobey, they realize they're naked. It is very simple, my loved ones. Adam and Eve were in the presence of God. They dwelt in the presence of God. They had intimate communion with God. And what the Bible teaches is that they were covered with the glory of God, right? The righteousness of God, His glory. The Bible tells that God is clothed in a clothing of light. And that glory that God was revealed was covering Adam and Eve. And so they weren't aware that they were naked because they were covered with his glory. What happens when they sin? Another consequence is that what? That when they sin, when the virus, the infection of, of selfishness and sin comes into the human experience, what does God do? God has to step aside, as we mentioned earlier. But notice this is for a different reason. God steps aside so he does not destroy Adam and Eve. What do you mean? There can be nothing impure in the presence of God. When you study the Bible, and we're going to be studying the sanctuary, the sanctuary is where God dwelled. And if anything impure came into the presence of God, it was immediately consumed and destroyed. I'll give you an example. Imagine if the sun all of a sudden started to come closer to the earth. What would happen to us? Right? Eventually it's going to get hotter and hotter, and we would be what? Destroyed and consumed. I have a question. Who has more firepower? Who has more glory? Who has more, more uh, of consuming fire? Is it the sun or is it God? Well, the sun was created by God, so obviously it's God. Again, if Adam and Eve, after they had sinned, would have stayed in the presence of God, God would have destroyed them. So God, again, in His infinite love and mercy, He steps aside, He walks away from them, following their free will, and what happens is that because they are not longer, no longer covered with the glory of God, they have what? They are now realizing their nakedness. They are now realizing their true condition in front, in front of God. Is that without God, the human being is naked. And this nakedness, nakedness that the Bible speaks about is a representation of sin, right? And God sees us who we are and they were ashamed of that condition. But notice what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. It says, And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. In other words, 
Adam and Eve tried to solve the problem of sin. How? Not by trying to see how they can go back into the presence of God. They ran away from God. And what happens, my loved ones, is that they tried to take fig trees, right? They tried to take leaves and they tried to cover their own nakedness. What does that represent? What does covering your own nakedness represent? It, what we're going to see is that these fig leaves is the intent or the human beings trying to cover their nakedness or trying to cover their sins. They were ashamed of their sin and they did not want to be revealed at it. So they tried to cover it up. That is human efforts. That is human works trying to cover your sin. Question, does it work? Let's continue to read in verse number eight. It says, and when they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. I have a question. What the, didn't they just cover themselves up? What is he trying to say when God, when it says they realized they were naked in verse number seven and they covered their nakedness up. And then when God comes back, he's, his glory is veiled and he comes back. Why? He wants to reach out to his children. And Adam says, and he says, where are you? And Adam says, we've, we've hidden. Now, God knows where they are, right? What is going on here? This, this is inquiry, right? This is an investigation, an investigative judgment that is happening here. God is wanting to know. He's wanting Adam to confess. He knows the answer, but he wants Adam to confess. And Adam says, what? We hid ourselves because we were naked. Please explain that to me. He had, they had covered themselves up with the fig trees because they realized that they were naked. And then when God shows up, they hide because of their nakedness. What, does this, what is God trying to tell us here? Well, it says very clearly in Isaiah chapter 59, verse number 2. But your iniquities have separated you from God and your sins have what? Have hidden his face from you, right? There was a separation between God and his children. There was a separation. This is when they realize they're naked. And so what happens when they realize their condition, when they realize their nakedness and they understand this, Hebrews 4.13 says, and there is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. My loved ones, it, what is this showing? It's showing that humanity tries to cover their sin. The, the leaves are representing our own efforts to try to be right with God. And yet it says that for all of our intentions, for all of our works, it does not work for we are all naked. God sees us who we are. He sees through us. So I can come here. I can come here with my suit, with my tie, with my Bible under my arms. I can do all of these things and I can still be doing a sin, have a sinful life, right? I might be able to, to deceive you. I might to be able to make you think that I'm a godly man because of the way I'm dressing and how I speak and what I do. But God sees me for who I truly am, my loved ones. And this is what it's saying. Adam and Eve had covered their nakedness, but God saw them for who they are and they still hid themselves. And, and you follow me? And this is where it is, my loved ones. Humanity was trapped. Humanity was in a corner. Humanity was running from God after realizing the grave mistake that they had made. But God, my loved ones, still had a perfect plan in mind. Now, watch this and let's pay attention before we continue with this. It says, if you remember, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Remember that we read in Genesis 2.17, this same verse, and God says that the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Now, Adam and Eve did not die on that day, my loved ones. And the question is, why? Why did Adam and Eve not die? Now, some people like to get philosophical with this uh, concept, and they like to say, well, they began to spiritually die, and they began, but that's not what it says in the verse. When it says in Genesis 2.17 that they shall surely die, that word die in Hebrew, again, using the concordance, is the Hebrew word muth. 
So I wanted to understand what does it mean to die. So I found the word muth in Hebrew, and I used my concordance to find where else in the Bible it is used. And what did I find? I found in Genesis chapter 7, verse 22, talking about the flood, it says, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life did what? Died. There's that Hebrew word muth. And everything that was destroyed, and every living thing was destroyed, which is upon the face of the ground. My loved ones, it's saying here that what does it mean to die? What it means to die is to stop breathing, right? No more breath of life. You're dead. It says that they died, they were destroyed. In other words, God told them very clearly, the day that you eat of that tree, the day that you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the day that you disobey me, you shall surely die, you shall cease to exist. It was a death sentence. Now the question is, what happened that they didn't die? They did not die on that day, my loved ones. When we keep on reading Genesis chapter 3, we see the story. Adam and Eve did not die. What happened? Did God just change his mind? If you're a parent, or in my case, I was a teacher, and in my classroom, I had rules. I have a question. If I put up my rules, and then I put up the consequences for breaking those rules, and a student of mine breaks the rule, and I don't enforce the consequences... What's going to happen? I'm going to lose all respect, right? Same thing with a parent. If you put up guidelines, you put up rules in the house, and they break those rules and you don't follow up, and you don't present consequences, they're not going to respect you. So God, my loved ones, is not saying, you know what, I'm going to let this one slide. I think I'm going to let this one go. No, because it says very clearly in Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, God is not human that he should lie. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? My loved ones, when God told Adam and Eve, the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. You shall cease to exist. He was talking, he was talking seriously. He was really telling them what was going to happen. So the, quest, the, the question is, why did they not die? The answer, my loved ones, is right there in Genesis chapter 3. Go with me to Genesis chapter 3. I moved myself out, but if you go to Genesis chapter 3, look at what it says on verse number 21. Also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. What? Listen to me. Listen to what it's saying here. Adam and Eve recognized that they were naked after disobeying God and being out of the presence of God. It said they tried to cover their nakedness with the, the fig trees. It didn't work because God sees us for who we really are. And it says that then God clothed them. God solved the problem of nakedness. How? It says, and God made them tunics of skin and clothed them. Now, what does it imply that tunics of skin? If you have tunics of skin, that means that what? Something must have died. I have a question for you. What animal do you think died to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve? My loved ones, it's inferred that it was a lamb. A lamb died in the place of Adam and Eve. Genesis chapter 4 says that uh, Abel was a sheep herder, right? So a lamb died in their place. What is God trying to tell us? God is saying, you have disobeyed me. You have stepped aside. You have followed the, the way of the enemy. You do not want me in your life. You have placed somebody else in front of me. And now you're seeing the consequences of this. But I love you so much. I want to give you a second chance. And what he's saying is, I'm going to cover your nakedness. I'm going to solve the problem of sin in your life. How? Through the sacrifice of a lamb. My loved ones, God was revealing the plan of salvation. God was revealing his, the, uh, the, 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 the grace that he was presenting. God was showing his mercy for human beings. God was saying, you were supposed to die today. You were supposed to come to an end. But this lamb is dying in your place. And it is because of him that you have a second chance to live. And you are clothed with his skin, a representation of the lamb is Jesus Christ, and the skin cloth is what? Is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I say amen for that. God was revealing the plan of salvation. From the very beginning, grace was presented to humanity, my lovers. As soon as Adam and Eve fell, 
there was God to come in and pick them up, my loved ones. And I say, praise the Lord for God's plan of salvation as it was already developed and broken down, initiated in Genesis chapter 3. Praise the Lord. Now, why did God permit this rebellion? Again, we talked about this. It says in 1 John chapter 4, 8, For he who does not love does not know God, for God is what? God is love. That is the essence of God's character, right? His love, his freedom. God does not force anybody to follow him. God does not force anybody to love him, my loved ones. It is out of love. And when you see this example here, can you imagine how Adam and Eve felt after God had originally given them everything and they chose to disobey him and yet despite after disobeying him, despite after choosing to follow a different path, God then in his love and mercy comes back and he says, you know what? I want to give you a second chance. I want to show you how much I love you and I'm going to give you a second chance through this lamb, my loved ones. And that is how God earns his creatures worship. That's how it is through love. And that's why Jesus says, if I am raised up, I shall all shall come to me, my loved ones. It is through, we are persuaded through the love of God to follow him, to obey him. And praise the Lord for what the Bible is teaching us. It just We're just starting off in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. God is already revealing his character to us, revealing to us. And he's saying, not only am I going to give you a second chance, that second chance is going to come through my son. And so, again, going back to the enemy, the enemy is using all of his tactics for deception. The enemy is trying to do everything to try to have us walk away from God, to not obey God, to disobey God, to do our own will, to think that we can follow in our own ways, that we can declare and determine what is right or wrong. We don't need God to tell us what is it that we need to do. And so, one of the great deceptions that the enemy has, my loved ones, and it's very common that we see in Christianity, we find in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. And it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. One of these great deceptions that the enemy has, my loved ones, is he's telling today, follow your heart. Right? Just follow your heart, follow your emotions, follow your feelings. And I've seen this even preach from pulpits. I've seen ministers say, just follow your heart. Follow what your heart tells you, my loved ones. But the Bible says very clearly in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10, that the human heart is deceitful. Why? Because we have this human nature, this fallen human nature, this sin is pulling us and we're letting it pull and we're letting it drag us along. And so, my loved ones, we cannot trust in our feelings. We cannot trust in our emotions. It doesn't mean that feelings and emotions are wrong, right? They're bad in that context because God made them. The problem is when we put these feelings and emotions first over what? Look at what God says in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 17 and 19. Incline your ear. And hear the words of my wisdom and apply your heart to my knowledge, for it will be pleasant if you keep them within you. What is God saying? Don't follow your heart. Don't follow your feelings. Follow my word. God is saying, follow my word. Put your mind, put your heart into this. Follow what I say. Don't go by how you feel, what you think. Follow these principles Follow my foundation that I have given you and then your heart, your feelings and your emotions will fall in line with the correct way. That's what he's saying. But nowadays the devil is just follow your heart. We hear it in songs. We hear it all over the place in movies, especially sometimes sadly we hear it in the church from pulpits. People saying just follow your heart. No, follow the word of God. Let this book be light to our feet and a lamp that guides us and shows us the correct way. As we read also in the previous presentations about that the word of God is the way it shows us how to live righteously, how to live correctly. It reproves us. It shows us the correct way. And so that's what God is telling us, my loved ones. But the enemy just continues to deceive. And I want to show you something. It's a terrible, terrible verse. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, it says the whole world lies in the power of of the evil one. That is a terrifying, terrifying verse. How much? The whole world 
lies in the power of the evil one based on all of the things that we have been talking about today. The whole world is in the enemy's hands. Now, these deceptions about following the heart, they're all coming together, but there is a great end time deceptions. There is an end time deception, my loved ones, which is the focus of the book of Revelation is warning us about this great end time deceptions that we find that the devil is using to deceive to perfection. And it says that the whole world, right, is deceived. If you remember, we read in Revelation chapter 12, verse number 7 yesterday, and it says in verse number 9 that he deceives the whole world. My loved ones, if you think that you are not deceived, you're like, oh, that's not my worry, not, not my issue, then you are exactly where the enemy wants you. Because a deception is that you're not aware of the deception. If you knew that you were deceived, then it would not be a deception. It says the whole world is deceived. Everybody is following in the ways of the enemy. So how, what is the only thing that we can use to understand and to know that, we, that we're not following in the ways? We have to make sure that we're founded on the word of God, that we're following the light of God. Now, what is this great end time deception that I talked about and that we're mentioning? It has to do with the beast. Look at this in Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. In our previous presentation, uh, one of the previous ones, we were talking about breaking this down, right? The beast, based on Daniel chapter 7, says that the beast represents a kingdom, right? And it says also that the beast has seven heads. We saw that the seven heads were seven hills, right? And he comes out of the sea. He comes out where there are people, nations, tribes, and multitudes. And look at what it says here. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now, who is the dragon? China, right? No, China's not the dragon. Remember, we're not interpreting the Bible. We're not interpreting the symbols of, of prophecy based on our own knowledge, based on what we know and what we like. We have to let the Bible explain. So when it says that the dragon is the one that has given him the power and the authority, we know that the dragon is who? The dragon is the devil based on Revelation chapter 7 as it further uh, verse through verse 9. And it says the dragon gave him. Who's him? It's the beast. He gave the beast, this nation that's going to rise up, power, great authority, his throne. And it says, and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. We're going to see that that's, that little horn is the Antichrist. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon. Notice this. They worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to make, and to make war with him? Notice, my loved ones, that the dragon, again, the devil, he doesn't present himself directly. He's hiding behind his human instruments. We saw him hide behind the serpent. We see him hide behind, the, in Ezekiel 28, the king. Here we're seeing that he hides behind what? Behind the beasts. He's hiding behind this beast, this kingdom, this nation that is rising up from people, multitude nations that has seven hills. And he's using this beast to deceive the whole world world. And notice what it says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 and 25. It says, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth and shall think to change the times and the law. What? Yes, my loved ones, this very beast that the devil is using is going to do what? This kingdom is going to try to change God's time and God's holy law. Now, that's nothing new because we already saw that the Ten Commandments is the foundation of God's kingdom, of God's throne, of God's government. And we saw that it says that the devil sins from the beginning in 1 John chapter 4. He sins from the beginning. He rebels against God's law because sin is the transgression of the law. So what is the devil doing? He is using this kingdom. He is using this nation that is going to rise up. And he's doing what? He's deceiving the world, and one of the deceptions is what? Is that he's getting, er he's getting that kingdom to try to change God's holy law. Why? Because those are the principles, the moral principles, the moral foundation of God's throne, of God's kingdom, of God's power, are what? Are his holy law, which is a reflection of his character, his purity, his holiness. 
And so the devil, knowing that, doesn't want anybody to know about this. And what does he do? He uses the beast in Revelation. We're going to see that connection between Daniel 7 and Revelation further on in the, in the seminar. He uses it to do what? To trick all of humanity. And look at what it continues to say in verse chapter number 13. And it says in verse number 16, he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast for its number of man, and his number is 666. If you continue to read Rev Revelation chapter 13, I invite you to read it. It's going to be a little confusing. You're going to be like, what is going on here? You have to, a beast. You have another beast. You have the mark of the beast. You have the number 666. You have all of this prophetic panorama. And you're like, what is going on? Don't worry about it. We're going to break down this whole chapter verse by verse, word by word, phrase by phrase, as we continue to go, because this is talking about this end time deception that the enemy, the dragon is going to do through this beast, through this kingdom. And so again, if God is warning us about these things in prophecy, he's not leaving it up to us to try to figure this out on our own and try to see if we can come up with the answer. God is going to clearly indicate, clearly show us through his word exactly what is it talking about. Why? So that we are prepared, so that we are not deceived with what is coming and this end time deception. And for that, I say, Amen. Praise the Lord for what we're seeing, my loved ones. God is preparing us. God is showing us what is happening. And again, do we have to worry about the beast? Do we have to worry about the devil? Look at what Romans chapter 16 verse 20 says. And the God of peace shall crush Satan where? Shall crush Satan under your feet surely. Praise the Lord. We already know that the devil is going to be destroyed, that the devil is going to cease to exist, my loved ones. And so anyone that is also following that ways, in this context, we're talking about the beast of Revelation. It tells us very clearly that what? That they shall also be destroyed. Look at what it says in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verse number 19. It says, And I saw the beast... The kings of the earth and the armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured and with him the false prophet who marked signs in this presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worship him. And the two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Here the lake of fire, my loved ones, not only destroys the beast, the Bible says, that was created for the devil, but it also destroys, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't only destroy the devil, the, the devil, Satan, it also destroys the beast and those that follow him. And once this happens, what does it say in the book of Nahum? It says very clearly that affliction will not rise up a second time. Amen? Once we're going to see that revelation reveals that all of this, the devil, the beast, the, the, the false prophet, the second beast, Babylon, is all going to come an end to this world and God is going to establish his kingdom. His righteousness again. This is the wonderful promise. And if you remember, Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 and 4 says, And I saw a new heavens and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away away. I say, praise the Lord. This is the promise that God has revealed to us. My loved ones, God is showing us all these things. He wants to prepare us, but we don't need to be worried if we're holding on to the word of God. Isaiah 41 10, do not fear for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will always help you. I will uphold you with your righteous right hand. We are going to continue to study these things, but we should not worry. We should submit to God and watch how he watches over us, guides us, protects us through these things, my loved ones, as we have been studying and will continue to study. May God continue to bless you abundantly.